evening tonight late tonight actually this is the late late show we never go on this late it's way past all of our bedtimes but we're we're gonna make an exception i guess i just got done watching blank check with the family nice little 90s movie you know it's funny about blank check actually is it's <laughs> probably has you know like what you know how like movies have like sensibilities like there's 80s movie sensibilities like i guess blank check has the most blatant 90s like logic sensibilities i don't know how to verbalize that it's like 90s logic like what it was at the time i don't know i don't know if that makes sense but um yeah, it was a good it was good it was a good rewatch. Hadn't seen that in since the 90s probably. Probably since the 90s. So, tonight we're talking about Spot, legendary producer for SST Records, um who passed away today. And uh I'm not going to just bury the lead. Let's just jump right into it. Um I'm I'm really well, I'm very sad that, you know, Spot has passed. But, you know, particularly maybe selfishly even or at least self-seekingly, you know, I was actively trying to interview Spot and I knew he was ailing and I reached out when I didn't know he was ailing and I'm just bummed I never got to talk to him. I, I really would have liked to have interviewed him. I had so many questions to ask him and I'll never get a chance to. And that's the saddest part about, you know missing out on interviewing someone you know i mean obviously them leaving this mortal plane terrible in and of itself but also just from a historical standpoint it just it's a bummer it's a, it's a bummer all the way around dude was uh absolutely legendary and just left behind such a legacy of work brought so many great works of punk rock legendary punk rock majesty to life i guess i don't know what else how else yeah interview greg ginn yeah right <laughs> yeah it's just it's a bummer it's a bummer uh it really is hello hello everyone hi tofu hi cringe kid um hi sean so we're talking about spot what are people saying about Spot? Who was Spot? Spot was a producer. He was the in-house producer for SST Records. SST Records was Greg Ginn's label that he sort of co-owned somewhat with uh, Chuck Dukowski for a while. And then Chuck eventually liquidated his share. And we covered all of that in painstaking detail over the course of five hours in our Black Flag uh, breakdown so check that out somewhere on the channel but we didn't really talk about spot much and spot you know he not only did he you know produce for sst but you know by you know by association the misfits ended up working with him on earth ad so he's credited as a co-producer of earth ad and we probably have um him to thank for a lot of the sound and aesthetic on earth ad and we'll try you know there's not too much documented publicly about that either which is a real shame henry rollins has said that he sang backup vocals for an earth ad session something else i didn't know until you know or at least was re-reminded of when i re when i dug up that recording of him talking about it um Interesting, really interesting stuff. So, but we have a little scrap of him here talking about it because he did speak to someone about his experiences with Earth AD, which I was curious to hear about in particular. But I figured we would just read a few things, kind of like what we did with Harry Pyro when Harry Pyro passed away, just sort of like go over a couple of like retrospective things about Spot. Um, he was also something else. He was the, I guess he was technically the first bass player of Black Flag, but in like a Diane D. Piazza kind of way. Like he, like Chuck Dukowski is the first bass player of Black Flag, like de facto, hands down. But like, you know, when they were doing rehearsals before Chuck came in in any kind of official capacity, you know, um, Spot was rehearsing with them on bass. And he's very, I think he's very like, 
upfront about that. He doesn't take any, or he didn't take any kind of like actual credit as being like really in Black Flag in any kind of meaningful way in the way that Chuck Dukowski was the heart of Black Flag, right? That's what that's what's often said about the Duke himself. Um, let's start off with, this was written, this is what's getting picked up by all the news right now. This thing, this is written by Joe Carducci. I hope I'm saying that right. And Joe was another sort of SST black flag guy. Um, I don't know exactly. He was a writer. He is a writer. Uh, he posted this to Facebook. So let's take a look at that first and see what he says there. If I could find it, I think it's right. I think this is it. Yeah, here it is. So here's what um, this is what Joe has to say. I'll make it small. It's a nice picture of Spot right here. Spot, Glenn M. Lockett, 1951 to 2023. I hate to type out the words, but Spot has passed away af uh, after 10 a.m. today, Saturday. So he died today um, at Morningside Healthcare in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. His nurse told me that he woke up all right, but later showed no pulse and several attempts to revive him failed. He had canceled a planned photography exhibit in late 2021 when he found out his fibrosis began to impair lung, lung function. Since he had been on oxygen and was hoping for a lung trans, he, so sorry, since then he had been on oxygen and was hoping for a lung transplant, but a stroke about three months ago put him in the hospital, which makes me feel really bad for trying to reach out and contact him for an interview on this channel. I had no idea it was going through all, all of that, at least. You know, I knew that he had been ailing, but not in that kind of way. Such a bummer, man. Um, I was hoping that he was recovering speech, but realistically, he was not likely at his age and condition to become a candidate for a lung transplant, though uh, I believe, wait, sorry, though that would have solved his health problems. Isn't that, what a shame, man. What a shame. You know, and it really says something about, you know, the availability of organs and, and, and how that all works. And if we did have, not to get political here, but like, you know, if we, I don't know if this is a political thing, but just like that, you know, if we did have the means of using stem cells to grow new organs from scratch, like you wouldn't have to worry about being a candidate for a lung transplant, like meaning like whether you were what priority you were for a lung transplant, you would just be able to have anybody could have whatever organ they needed at any particular time. And it's just a shame that that technology is not more developed. Perhaps it would have, you know, that's exactly. And as Joe says, he said that that would have been the answer for his health problems. Um, it would have solved his health problems. Spot didn't dwell a lot on his personal history, but I believe that he was born in Los Angeles, grew up in the Crenshaw neighborhood, that's where uh, that's where Richard and Danny Elfman, I think, also were raised in Cren in the Crenshaw neighborhood. Uh, moved to Hermosa Beach in the mid '70s. Moved to his favorite Black Flag tour stop, Austin, Texas, in the mid '80s, and then to Sheboygan to be near his favorite Celtic uh, Celtic music scenes in the wow. There's a Celtic music scene in the Milwaukee uh, in Milwaukee and Chicago, huh? His father was Claiborne Lockett, who was a Tuskegee Airman. Wow. If you know the history of the Tuskegee Airmen, wow. Who flew uh, British Spitfires. And Spot once told me his mother was Native American from New Orleans. His older sister has advanced dementia. Spot was a musician and writer and photographer who spelled his name in all caps with a dot in the middle of the O. His principal sideline was as a record producer engineer and an architect of the natural approach to recording a band in the punk era. You know, he never, even though they were a SST band, yes, Kevin, yes, Spot passed away, unfortunately. Um, you know, I, I know that, that the Bad Brains were on SST at one point, I don't think Spot ever worked with them. We'd have to double check on that. What a combination Spot with the Bad Brains. That would have been that would have been pretty cool to have seen. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe he did work with 
black flag, uh, bad brains at some point. His principal sideline was as a record producer, engineer, and an architect of the natural approach to recording a band in the punk era. He started in the Hermosa in Hermosa Beach, playing and recording jazz, and he took the primacy of live jazz playing into recording bands against prevailing attempts to soften or industrialize a back-to-basics art movement in sound. When approaching the mixing board, Spot would assume an Elvis-like stance and then gesture toward all the knobs, he would say in a Louis Armstrong, Louis Armstrong-like voice, this is going to be gelatinous. <laughs> his, uh, his recorded work as a player and producer is listed at Discogs.com. Okay, so we could really go through. We could find that out at Discogs, I guess, right? That's what we could do. Um. I'll be going through his writing with an eye towards publishing a collection, including his writings on jazz for the Hermosa Beach Free Weekly. He spent recent years writing the novel Decline and Fall of Alternative Civilization and producing a radio-like dramatization of it, which is online. Wow. Got to check that out, maybe. Last year, he posted a new spot music at his Bandcamp page. In recent weeks, I read off lists of names of his well-wishers to him, and Spot nodded at the mentions of his friends from around the country and the world. And here he is. Uh, the photo is by Bill Daniel. Uh, and this is Spot at Third Coast Studio in Austin, Texas, March 14th, 1982, recording uh, the fun, fun, fun session for the big boys. There he is. Uh, long live Spot. Long live Spot. What is? Uh, let's see what Jerry Only had to say about Spot's passing. You know, Jerry Only's uh, very classy when someone passes away. Jerry Only um, is really classy about uh, honoring honoring people who have who have passed away. And I like what he said here about Spot. Let's see if we can. Oh, that's annoying. You can't really see it in the thing because I got so many thingamabangs here. That's really annoying. All right. I'll just read what what was written. It's very brief. Uh, this is from the Misfits Facebook page. It says, RIP Earth AD producer engineer spot. Sad news that a real pioneer of the early recording days spot, real name Glenn Lockett, engineer and producer on our classic Earth AD album passed away today. He was always someone who would push the limits to get the job done. May he rest in peace and never be forgotten, Jerry only. Um, very classy, Jerry. I, I'm not saying that sarcastically. I really mean it. Like, I think that, that what a nice thing uh, to notate. You know, I, I doubt <laughs> I think we're going to hear anything from Glenn. Glenn uh, who knows? Who knows? Um, that's sad really sad and then uh so the next thing that i wanted to take a look at this is really cool this is really sweet um this is like this is from 2018 and it's sort of like a comprehensive overview of spot and his career and you know like i said i know that he was in charge of damaged and and earth ad I knew that he had worked with like the Minutemen and Descendants, but I really didn't have, I really didn't understand the full scope of Spot as the in-house producer for SST, you know? So this is like a pretty cool retrospective of him that I, I just wanted to take a look at. And it's late and I'm going to start to jam through this because it is so late. But I just felt like, hey, we should salute Spot on his uh, on the day that he leaves. It's just not. I, I didn't want to do this tomorrow. By the way, everybody, I just want to tell you, um, if you're a seltzer drinker like me, this bubbly, this is the new bubbly flavor. This is the orange cream bubbly, and it is really good. It's like the Polar. You know how Polar had their own? They also had uh, orange vanilla, and this is very similar. Mm, super refreshing. Hits the back of the throat just in the right way. Really quenches the thirst, I think. 
Dan is here. Hi, Dan. Dan says, uh, RIP Spot, he was involved with lots of great records. One of my favorite records he produced was the Cruce F-U-C-Ks. I believe that's the last record. As I was looking through his discography, that was the last record that he did for SST, actually, in 86. But let's look. Let's look. So this is this was from 2018. Behind the Sound of American Punk, Spot, a house engineer and producer for SSD Records, gave early 80s hardcore the space to be itself. There he is. There's Spot now or recently. And um, man, he was the house engineer. Think about that, which I guess made them sort of like the de facto producer outside of whatever bands he was working with, because of course the bands probably had a say in what they wanted their sound to be. Um, I'm going to sort of, if the, if a comment is left, we'll go back and return to it. I want to make sure that we get through this in a, in a timely fashion. So we're not here till like one o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> Between 1979 and 1985. Oh, who wrote, who wrote this? It does not say, wait, let's check. There's got to be an author here. This is by Sam Backer on November 9th. 2018 and it's for uh it's for a website called the daily red bull music academy.com i guess between 1979 and 1985 oh so it was 85 i thought it last oh well the record came out in 86 but i guess he worked until 85 uh glenn lockett helped define the sound of american punk Working under the name Spot, he served as the house engineer and producer for Los Angeles-based SST Records during the years when the label reimagined the underground. Along the way, he brought to life countless records, including Black Flag's hardcore manifesto, Damaged, The Descendants' pop-embracing Milo Goes to College. That's a huge record. I didn't know that Spot engineer slash produced that. Uh, Milo Goes to College, what a... You know, obviously all the Black Flag stuff too, but I mean, just to be involved with so many records, to be involved with the Misfits, the Descendants, Black Flag, Minutemen, Husker Du, I mean, what a list. Meat Puppets, St. Vitus, it goes on and on. I mean, Zen Arcade, man, that's like a huge record. That's a huge freaking record. That's nuts. That's really nuts. Um, so the Descendants, Pop Embracing, Mile Goes, I mean, Mile Goes to College, that's like, you know, every band in the same way that I, I, I like in I like in the descendants and Milo goes to college to the New York Dolls and their self-titled record and hair metal. You know, here you have and it's funny because it's roughly like it's rough. It's roughly sort of like the same age, like if if everything that came in the 90s kind of owes it uh, could tip tip their hat to the descendants Milo goes to college. You could say the same thing about a lot of the hair metal in the eighties with tipping their hat to the New York dolls in 72. Right. Isn't that funny how it works? That was in 72. And then, and then Milo goes to college was 82. And then for the decade of the eighties and the decade of the nineties, you had all these bands just sort of, you know, following in this template not a, a template, what I don't know, like influ heavily influenced in a meaningful way. And Spot, you know, Spot has something to do with that a little bit. Now, that wasn't the first Ascendance record to come out. There was that single that they put out. But man, Milo Goes to College, phew, masterpiece. Husker Dew's gut-wrenching Zen Arcade and St. Vitus's self-titled Sludge Feast St. Vitus. With this music, Spot and SST set the stage for the next two decades of rock, influencing everything from pop punk to doom metal. By the way, I heard somebody say this. I think we talked about this in the Black Flag episode. I just want to say it reiterated here because I thought it was very interesting. If Black Flag never broke up, if Black Flag had never broken up and SST had kept putting out records like they were in the 80s into the 90s, that perhaps SST and Black Flag would have been right there at the sort of grunge explosion. And maybe they would have even been included in that grunge explosion, even though they weren't, didn't aesthetically sound like all those bands. Because remember, 
grunge is sort of like a corporate term. Grunge is the equivalent of what new wave was, right? New wave was another term. These are terms that are invented by record companies to try and sell genres of music to homogenized masses. And that perhaps SST and Black Flag might have been a part of that in some way, shape, or form. How? Like the particulars? I don't know. We're talking, we're, we are theorizing about alternative history that alternative history, haha. We're theorizing about a, a history that never happened, but it's fun. It's fun to sort of think about these things from time to time. Uh, despite this pedigree, Spot doesn't seem like anyone's idea of a prototypical punk. An avid roller skater and photographer, he's always loved the bagpipes and spent a while in the late 70s learning to play the clarinet. Really, the idea that such a prototype even exists has been annoying him for the past two or three decades. Speaking over the phone from his house in Wisconsin, Spot vents some of his frustration with the way his scene has been remembered. It seems that the whole history of punk rock, and especially the stuff that happened in L.A., is based on a lot of myths, he explains, his voice rising. There was a lot more influences and ideas about life and culture that most people either don't have a clue about or aren't really all that willing to accept. A native of L.A., Spot grew up exposed to the extraordinary variety of sounds flowing through the neighborhoods where he lived. I had been raised listening to post-bebop jazz, he says. Going back into the 50s, I'd be at a family barbecues where they're playing Thelonious Monk and stuff like that. Getting his first guitar in 1963 at the age of 12, Spot learned to play along with the torrent of exciting sounds pouring from the AM dial. Surf rock, British invasion, Motown, all of it was happening all at once. Uh, Spot's stripped-down production and jazz-derived interest in live performance forced the musicians to work within their means, both sonically and aesthetically. See, when I hear that, that very that little snippet of writing, that makes me like wish that Spot was working with the Bad Brains. Imagine what Spot would have done with a post with a post uh, Roar cassette Bad Brains, the Roar cassette, the self-titled Bad Brains album. That band working with spot in like 1983 1981 1982 when did that cassette come out was that 81 now we got to look it up what's this up bad brains roar cassette um yeah okay so that came out it was released in february of 82 February 5th of 82 was recorded in uh, uh, stu- uh, on Avenue A. What was it? Uh, Studio 171A. There you go. So yeah, so that to me, that those bad brains, the 82 bad brains working with Spot, oh man, doing doing something where uh, they have to, you know, have a stripped down production, stripped down production and jazz derived uh, interest in live performance. That would be cool with the bad brains. Hell yeah. By the early 1970s, Spot had fallen in love with a complex with complex musical styles that dominated among the rock for art's sake crowd. I was really enamored with a lot of what I guess you would call progressive rock, he said. That whole era with concept albums, when jazz fusion started happening before it turned into BS. Playing around Los Angeles, both in bands and as a studio musician, Spot's own music stuck closely to this aesthetic one based on uh on a set of fixed ideas about what was and what was not quality music i was interested in following this path uh that i thought was the right path it was about being sophisticated and really exploring music and being as good as you possibly could be without watering it down into something that's just about making money or being popular by the mid by the mid 70s spot felt that this approach was growing tired. The early inventiveness that had driven Prague and fusion had become overbearing and repetitive. In parallel with his growing disenchantment with a record industry he saw as increasingly categorized and commercial, Spot's own attempts to pull together a career playing the music he loved had gone nowhere. 
I auditioned once for Captain Beefheart. Maybe I could say I almost got into Beefheart, he laughs. Finally, I just found a situation where some people were building a recording studio, the Media Art Studio in Hermosa Beach, California, and I said, can I help you build it? So here you have the Minutemen at the New Wave Theater, and this is in 1980. There's D. Boone, the legendary D. Boone right there, and that is the legendary Mike Watt. And then over here, this is a basement gig, it says. Um, these are photos taken by Spot. Working at the studio taught Spot the ropes of recording, starting as a tape operator, a position he describes as being little more than a glorified remote control. Because you literally, all you got to do, if you have the mixing console, console right here, that where everything's going into the board, off to the side, out of the board, you've, you, you have all your things are plugged into the board, and then you have things that are that are going out of the board, wires that are going into a recording machine, the actual recording machine, the you know the 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 reels of tape, and that if you are the but you're a glorified button pusher, if you are the tape operator, but it's a very important position in the in a day and age where you didn't have you know, automated remote controls, like maybe they, well, now you really don't need it today because everything could be consolidated to a computer or whatever. But back in those days, it was like, hey, you had to have a guy, there had to be a guy that was actually going to hit record on, on, the, uh, on the tape that was playing, you know, or at least depending on the setup. You know, I'm sure there were a lot of engineers who were, who were wearing tons of hats, spot included, right? Um, interesting to say the least. In any case... He, he describes as little more than a glorified remote control. He gradually gained the skills to record sessions on his own. There were a lot of people, he says with a sigh, who had gone through their rock and roll period and now they were just trying to be serious songwriter artists. They would just spend all this time doing all these overdubs and all these songs that weren't really that exciting. The occasional jazz sessions booked at the studio, however, were far more intriguing. Hermosa had a long history with the music. The lighthouse and nearby club had helped to make a city a center for West Coast jazz during the 50s. Despite its decline, still brought in musicians from across the city. The jazz players that came to the media arts center didn't want anything fancy, Spot explains. They just wanted to get things down and they didn't care if someone played a bad note or not. And that's the thing about bad notes. Bad notes, they can be sticky. And you know what else is sticky? Freaking Riot Stickers are sticky. That's right. Riot Stickers is the sponsor of the From Us channel. And um, we're running a special deal for Riot Stickers. You can get 1,000 stickers for $79. They're three inch by three inch stickers. They look a little bit like this. These are 2.5 by three inches. Uh, as you can see here, they're, they are shiny because... They are printed on vinyl, which makes them very waterproof, and they have a UV coating that protects them from the sun. So these stickers have a, have a, have a sticking life uh, of a minimum of five years. I mean, you really, and that's pretty good for, for a sticker life, you know, directly exposed to the elements indoors perpetually forever, right? But we're just talking about like outdoor weathering the elements. Like I said, $79 for a thousand stickers. You know, it's funny. I actually, I screenshotted it on my other computer. But basically, you can get. I saw somebody was advertising a deal: two hundred and fifty dollars uh, stickers for seventy nine dollars, versus a thousand. So Sharpie Riot and RiotStickers.com they are offering you four times the amount of stickers for the same price. So for uh, seventy nine dollars for two hundred fifty stickers, and you don't even know how good those stickers might be compared to RiotStickers.com. I mean, it's an incredible deal. The link is in the description. It's ridestickers.com backslash from us. Make sure you check it out. Do not miss out on this insane deal. You're not going to find a better one. And it's only available here on my channel in the description of these videos. Ridestickers.com because Riot Stickers, they are the bomb.
So anyway, we were talking about Spot and recording just blocks away from the studio, a bubbling scene of skaters, surfers, and musicians had started to develop on Hermosa's aging beachfront. While waiting tables at a local vegan restaurant for some extra cash, Spot met Greg Ginn, the guitarist who would go on to found the hardcore pioneer's Black Flag. Spot had been moonlighting as a music critic for the Easy Reader, a local paper, and Ginn, an early punk convert, had strong and not necessarily positive thoughts about his taste in records. I didn't know what to think of the guy, Spot remembers. He was telling me about these other bands and all the things that, that were starting to happen. I'm thinking, well, maybe I should start looking into this. Intrigued by Ginn, Spot would occasionally jam with him and the rest of Black Flag at their dilapidated practice space. But it wasn't until he saw a riot break out during their performance at an outdoor concert in Manhattan Beach's Pollywog Park that he realized that he wanted to produce them. That show was just so crazy, he recalls. I said, I got to record this band before they get killed. Recording on the cheap during the off hours at the studio, the band spent a year working on 1980s Jealous Again, featuring a razor-thin sound that complemented guitarist Gin's squirming leads and Julio Valencia's precisely calibrated drum rolls. The record is Black Flag at its tightest and most aggressive, packing five songs into its into its six and a half minute run time. Here is this looks like this is Black Flag with Dez singing. Uh, and there's Robo, right? Yeah, this is Black Flag 1980. So what's funny is both Dez and uh, Ron Reyes, who preceded him, were fans of Black Flags who eventually became singers of the band, just like Henry Rollins. So it's funny how it's funny how that happened, right? Like, you know, you're you're a big fan. You're, you're a big fan. And um, all of a sudden, before you know it, you're singing for your favorite band. Despite Jealous Again's brevity, the process of recording it was anything but easy. The band was cycling through lead singers. And for months, it wasn't clear who was to be the vocalist on the record. To top it off, despite their inexperience, the members of Black Flag believed that they knew how to record better than Spot did, making the recording process a constant struggle for control. It was about a year's worth of wondering if any of this stuff would come to fruition. And this is why I think it's the first four years record. You have that first four years record where you have like the same, you have, you have different dudes. You have Keith Morris, Ron Reyes and Des, I think, all singing the same group of songs over and over again, right? Something like that. There's like three versions of the same song. Um, Spot says, a lot of headbutting. His frustration notwithstanding, Spot realized that the scene developing around Black Flag offered him something that he wasn't getting anywhere else. I wasn't sure what it was, he remembers, but it was something new. And I said, well... I'm going in that direction for now, and I'll see what happens. Jealous Again was the third record on SST, the label that Ginn had created to release Black Flag's music, quickly growing to include like-minded groups such as Saccharine Trust and the Minutemen. SST became the center for an innovative strain of working-class punk. But that's the way it was. There were a lot of labels, like, a, you know, I mean, I, I it's this is sort of a generalized statement, I guess. But you have like a label that sort of anchors around a scene. You had Discord Records in the DC area, right? You had um, SST. You had Alternative Tentacles. You had uh, not Slash. What was the other one? Yeah, Slash Records. I think you had Slash Records. You had Touch and Go Records. Um, I'm sure there's a bunch more that I'm forgetting. Uh, you had, what was up in the Boston area? What was the name of it? Uh, Tang? Was it Tang Records, maybe? You had Tang Records up in the Boston area. And then, I don't know, in New York. Well, New York, maybe it was a little bit more, uh, it wasn't as independent. You had like, I mean, Sire Records that signed a lot of those punk bands. I don't know if you'd really count that. You had Orc. Orc put, put out a bunch of punk singles. 
nothing like nothing like any of the other labels that I mentioned. Of course, there was Plan Nine Records, but that was really Plan Nine Records was you know initially like SST and that it was just it's just a place for Glenn to put out his own music on his own label. He wasn't really trying, apart from the Victims and apart from a Glenn Danzig solo record and almost a the first Undead record. Plan Nine is exclusively Misfits releases, right? Um, to spot these bands echoed the principles of his favorite musicians. I like listening to really out there jazz and all of that progressive stuff where people really took chances. Suddenly, the chances were happening in a different way, but they were big chances that people were taking. After its first handful of releases in 1979 and 80, SST began to expand rapidly and Spot was carried along by the momentum. In addition to serving as the sound man for Black Flag's earliest tours, he also settled into a role as the label's in-house producer, part of a small team responsible for keeping the business going as it teetered on the brink of financial collapse. Although eventually... It started to get they started making they started making good money. They started making good money. Yeah, okay, thank you, Dan. I, I know I said I wasn't gonna acknowledge the comments, but Dan Dan pointed something out. Epitaph too, bad religion, their their label, which by the way, really exploded in the 90s. But you don't think of that as like a scene the way you think of like Discord being its own scene or Tang Records or Touch and Go. And that's really what I was trying to get get at, I suppose, on some level. Um, where, where was I? Yeah, it says the brink of financial collapse. But man, I mean, SST started making a lot of money. You know, all those bands in SST, they never got paid. N not to dwell on all that stuff, but that nobody nobody got royalties. I mean, SST SST was keeping all that money. Um, so I don't know. I know there's a, there's a new book about SST, something about like corporate rock sucks. I want to check that out. Maybe that gets to the bottom of some of those things. There were no budgets. He says we had to go in there, get things set up quick, go through the tracks quick, and then get the stuff mixed quick because that was, uh, because that was all the time and all the money we had to work, work with. It had to get done. At SST, these financial constraints helped shape a new sound, helped to shape a new sound. Recording with bands that were rapidly pushing past the boundaries of hardcore, Spot's stripped-down production and jazz-derived interest in the live performance forced the musicians to work within their means both sonically and aesthetically, moving away from the post-Beatles idea of using the studio as a tool for creating music Spots production, and we saw what happened to the Beatles. Sorry, quick Beatles sidetrack tangent real quick. The Beatles started experimenting in the studio, really, you know, sort of reaching the, the pinnacle of that with Sgt. Pepper, right? And then slowly but surely stripping their sound back down again. Maybe not stripping it down. Yeah, kind of. I don't know. You really can't say that about the White Album, but that or Abbey Road. But then, but when you look at Let It Be, Let It Be, the whole point of the Get Back sessions was to strip everything back down to songs that could be played live. Like they couldn't play any of the Sgt. Pepper songs live. They could now, but at the time, it would have required a lot, lot more than just the Four Beatles to do so. Um, so it's kind of interesting what what the, what he's saying here. It's like, hey, we're we, we have to get get away from these post beatle this post beatle of idea of using the studio as a tool to create music spots production centered on seeing the studio as merely a place to capture it everything was based on the idea of playing the music right when you were playing it live and then recording that so i mean i don't want to take away from spots you know a, approach to music or anything but like you know is wasn't that all punk records for the most part i mean there how many bands how many punk bands weren't recording their music live we were just talking about the bad brains uh roar cassette i mean that was recorded live i mean i think a lot of bands 
I don't know. I can, you know, I don't want to sit here and try and, you know, dollar nickel and dime, which ones did and which ones didn't. But I think a lot of bands kind of were capturing their, their sound live or as live as possible. So, uh, you know, maybe not the Ramones per se, or maybe not, but like, look at Funhouse was recorded live, you know, um, Spots approach enabled the band to translate their well-honed live style to the studio, and it stopped them uh, from producing music that they couldn't take on the road. That is a good point, though. That's what we were just saying about the Beatles. This idea that what you're hearing on the record is going to be able to be reproduced live easily because we're literally recording like this live sort of sound. It makes sense. It does make sense. But to call that, I don't know. I feel like the, the 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 idea here is that this was something proprietary to Spot, and you know, again, I don't know if I don't know. I don't know if that's necessarily the case. Two albums by the Minutemen, a San, a San Pedro trio, whose sound was a unique fusion of funk, post punk, jazz, and hardcore. Talk about talk about outside of the box. You have the Minutemen. I bet Spot loved the Minutemen. Obviously, he did. He recorded them a whole bunch. Uh, offer some of the best examples of what this kind of production could unlock. That's a good point. Producing Buzz or Howl under the influence of heat and what makes a man start fires in 1982 and 83, Spot just set them up the way I thought they should be set up, tuned, uh, turned on the tape machine and let them go. Although the, re the records contain jazz-inspired freakouts and complex jump cut maneuvers i think that's a great way to describe the minutemen complex jump cut maneuvers they are sort of jump cutting sonically uh their challenging songs never lost touch with the live experience working at a breakneck pace the minutemen strove to incorporate their politics into every aspect of their music including its creation and you know if you ever seen the minutemen documentary it's called We Jam Econo. What's going on, Angus? How are you? We'll get to comments later, a little bit later in the show. Uh, just trying to get through this piece. We, I have. I want to show you guys the Misfits uh, quote. That he, he talks about the Misfits. Actually, I have a soundbite. I think I have a soundbite for that, so that'll be good. Uh, recording bands as they sounded live had other important benefits. In the early 80s, touring was one of the only effective was the only effective way for an underground band to build an audience. Spot's approach enabled a band to translate their well-honed live style to the studio, and it stopped them from producing music that they couldn't take on the road. Uh, right, but like, well, we already talked about that. Nobody wanted to do something on a record that you couldn't reproduce live, said Dave Chandler. It's kind of like it's kind of like not, you know, not having a credit card, you know, like pay pay for whatever you have with the money that you have um, so that there's nothing, you know, so there's no uh, there's no foul ups. Uh, so he's talking about, so this is Dave Chandler saying nobody wanted to do something on a record that you couldn't reproduce live. That he was the guitarist for the infu influential doom metal group St. Vitus. All of us had seen too many bands like Led Zeppelin, for instance, where there are all these fancy nine guitars on one song, and then you go to the live show, and the songs suck because they can't play it like that. That's a good point. None of us, nobody on S. If you're going to have it sound a certain way on the record, you should try your best to reproduce it live. I'm not going to name a band. I'm not going to name this band because I'm not, actually this brings up a good point. There's a band who I used to gush about on here all the time who I have not gushed about in a very long time that I just worship their music. I love their music and something I've never said, maybe I've said it, but I've said it in like a lovingly critiqued way. Um, but my problem with this band is that they have this incredible talent for um, creating such big sound on their records. The records are so good. I love the records to death. And then when I saw them live, I was so let down because they play as a three piece, right? And I was thinking in my head, man, they need a guitar player or they need a keyboardist even. 
or even like someone who could kind of just sort of beat all of those things. Like sometimes they're doing keys, maybe they have a guitar on their back and then they just sort of switch around, whatever, because just playing guitar based drums, some of these songs, which were so big on the record, it just, it hurt the band live and the, you know, it was totally a resources thing. They just didn't have the money to have a fourth player with them. They could have had a touring fourth player, but it costs money to do that. And they were, you know, out on the road for three months at that time. And uh, it just, I, I was bummed to see them live in that capacity and just be like, wow, these songs sound nothing like what I want, what they could be sounding like on uh, in, in a live setting. And it was for that same reason that they're talking about in this record. And like I said, I'm not going to name the band, but I will say their live show suffered so terribly because, you know, we couldn't hear what they sounded like on the record in, in the live setting. So uh, he says, Dave Chandler continues, we wanted people to hear us like us. Our first record, every song was in one take. That's well, that's crazy. Here's two more pictures. This is a great photo of Henry Rollins with a bag on his head. It says Henry Rollins kook, which is kook, K-O-O-K. That's like a, a West Coast uh, colloquialism for, you know, a crazy person. I think kook is related to surfing, surfing kooks and stuff like that. And this is at the Unicorn office in West Hollywood, 1981. Unicorn Records, I think it was Unicorn Records and Unicorn Studios, um, uh, is where Black Flag did some recording, did a bunch of recording, but they eventually, they got into like, they were sort of, they, they were barred from recording. They ended up being barred from recording because of their contract with, they had like an exclusive contract with Unicorn. And then when Unicorn went bankrupt, they were finally able to release music. That was, that's why there's no Black Flag records in 1982. And that's why there is... In 83 and 84, there's like four records. It's like insane, the, the output. And this is the church where the Black Flag lived and practiced. And look at this. There's this crazy noose in this picture. This is a cool picture. Spot was really good at taking photos. Look at these beautiful sort of grainy black and white photos, man. I mean, really, really stellar. And that's 1980. Uh, nonstop touring was also a way for SST bands to discover and sign promising groups from cities across the nation of the bands encountered this way none did more to expand the label sound than the meat puppets a phoenix trio led by the brothers kurt and Kurt chris kirkwood originally playing a style of maniacal acid fried hardcore over three albums produced by spot the group transitioned to the trippy country rock that would make them underground legends in the 80s and the 90s and of course, it was Kurt Cobain who covered Lake of Fire that really made the Meat Puppets blow up in that kind of way. Recording with a band that routinely dropped acid or snorted MDMA before sessions, Spot worked to elevate the Meat Puppets' essential looseness. Spot had this concept, explains Derek Bostrom, the group's drummer, which he used to describe our music was gelatinous. He liked our gelatinous vibe and he would look for a gelatinous sound, which pretty well describes our work with him. Besides Black Flag, the SST group whose music reached the largest audience was Husker Du, a Minneapolis trio with a noisily melodic sound that gained fans nationwide in the mid-80s. The group's breakthrough 1984 Zen Arcade was an ambitious double album exploring family trauma, emotional turmoil, and social unrest over a loose narrative arc. Yeah, it's a concept. Zen Arcade is a concept record. Uh, the entire session, Spot says, from the basic tracks to the final mix was roughly about 100 hours. That's crazy. 100 hours, almost four days. That's it. Four days. But, you know, if you think about, if you think of that one working day is any is like 10 hours, so maybe it would take 10 10 days. I don't know. Some bands take a month to record a record. Other bands take three months. Some bands take six months. Some bands take even longer than that, um, which is not very, but a hundred hours, which is not very much time at all. None of it was perfect, but it was, but it just, but we just had to get it done playing vulnerable, inventive songs with all the fury and desperation of a band that had to get it right 
this take in one take. Husker do Husker do's work with Spot helps set the foundation for the alternative rock boom of the 90s. See, that's what I mean, man. That's what I mean. And who is at the forefront of the alternative rock boom of the 90s? Grunge people, you know? So in a way, like in a way it, it was already in the foundation, but it just would have been a pinpoint had it continued. It was high art built on an independent budget and its aesthetic success proved that punk could harness the full vocabulary of emotional life without losing its oppositional identity. While Husker Du would later push back against SST's insistence on them working with Spot, eventually winning the right to produce themselves for 1985's Flip Your Wig, they would never again recapture the roiling power and chaotic intensity he helped them showcase on Zen Arcade. This is crazy that the Misfits, we completely skipped over the Misfits Earth AD. They didn't even mention it. Don't worry, we're going to mention it. Um, but that's crazy that they didn't even mention it in this article. Maybe they will. There's still a little bit left. Um, but it's just funny. And like all the things that they mentioned and like all the things that, that Misfits don't even get mentioned in this is that insane. A key moment, Spot believes, occurred when people started calling things alternative. Although this is an article that's being done with Spot. So maybe they asked about the Misfits and he just didn't have anything really to say. Or maybe Spot was like, I don't really want to talk about the Misfits. I don't know. There's a lot of, there's a lot of room in there for why it could have been omitted. Uh, a key moment, Spot believes, occurred when people started calling things alternative. I think it pulled things in the wrong direction. All the things that had been opening up suddenly had to be defined and not just be what they were. And that's literally what happens to every single movement when it becomes homogenized. The moment something breaks free of its little microcosm, it no longer can just be what it is. And it all of a sudden has a label for what it is. And then it has an aesthetic and anything that doesn't fit that aesthetic isn't that thing. And that's the paradox of, you know, punk rock and what is conformist and non-conformist. And, you know, you can, it's like a parabolic evolution to be a conformist when everybody else is, or to be a non-conformist when everybody else is not being a conformist would to actually make it conformist. In which case, to be a conformist would actually be the real nonconformity. And I think that's the lot, a lot of the sick psychology of some of these people that are like embracing, you know, when you hear people say that like Trump is punk rock or being Republican is punk rock, I think that's where they're getting it from. They're like, there's so many people that are railing against this that it's become the conformist thing to do. And Punk is all about being non-conformist. Therefore, we're going to not conform and we're going to do the opposite because that makes us into the minority. So really, it just becomes like a contest of who's the coolest. And it's just completely idiotic and totally, utterly idiotic um, and, and a paradoxical in and of itself. And the best thing to do, I think, is to just I agree. Don't, no, nothing, even though we use labels here all the time, nothing really should. You don't need labels to define things. You know, you can just. It could just be what it is. Um, at the same time, tensions within SST have begun to tear the label apart. Despite increasing sales, bands complained about not getting paid. Here we go. So I'm glad they're addressing this. Good. I'm glad it's getting addressed. It should, it should be addressed. Uh, while Black Flag's ambitious schedule of releases absorbed attention and resources from other groups. So, A, there's increasing sales. B, bands are not getting paid. And C, uh, Black Flag's ambitious schedule of releases are absorbing attention and resources from the other groups. Eventually, Spot decided that he was over it. The dynamic of how the label functioned under that model just didn't work too well. I worked with them until I kind of couldn't work with them anymore. He explains, it's really sad. Spot left SST and Los Angeles in 1986 and moved to Austin, Texas. With the time to focus on his own music, he found himself drawn to an entirely different style. One thing Austin had going on was a pretty strong traditional Irish scene, he says. It was like, wow. 
this is like almost going to those punk shows. It was a bunch of people sitting around playing what they wanted to play uh, and playing it the way that they wanted to play it. As punk rock and alternative and whatever the F you want to call it kept getting bigger and bigger, I was able to jump off that and into a pool where I could just kind of float and not have to worry about swimming across this stream this many times in a day. But so that's what that's what Spot was gravitated towards, I guess, right? Like it, it was never about just, hey, I'm a punk rock or doing punk rock. He was gravitated towards the freedom of expression without having to, you know, fit under a label um, to be individual and unique and free to explore a space. And when that, that used to be what it was in punk rock until it became an aesthetic. And when it became an aesthetic, apart from other things, spots like I'm out and now I'm gravitating towards this Irish thing for the same reasons that I did towards punk, which leads you to the idea of what is more punk, the aesthetic conformist idea or the attitude of going wherever your freedom takes you, right? On some level, in some kind of way. Um, only occasionally producing local bands, Spot has spent recent decades focused on his own art, writing and recording folk and Celtic-influenced albums for his label, no auditions and publishing publishing two well-received books of photography. Despite almost completely ducking out of the music industry in the late 80s, Spot's impact has only grown in the years since. With his ability to draw brilliant performances from bands on, on time and under budget, he ensured SST's enormous artistic legacy, one visible everywhere in the next three decades of rock. That's true. Groups as varied as Green Day, Nirvana, Super Chunk, Electric Wizard, Modest Mouse, and the Red Hot Chili Peppers have cited albums he produced as major influences, while SST stalwarts like Black Flag and Saccharine Trust remain legendary today. Their t-shirts and patches worn by young fans around the world. Working behind the scenes, Spot was happy to serve as a facilitator, spending long hours striving to make sure that SST's that SST's bands sounded precisely like themselves. By doing so, Spot helped to create an extraordinary body of work, but at the cost of rendering much of his contribution invisible, or at least mostly invisible. Whenever he received vinyl copies of his SST records, St. Vitus guitarist Dave Chandler noticed something mysterious. The runoff grooves at the center of the vinyl had cryptic phrases written on them, like worship volcanoes on virgin knees or Los Alamos, another roadside refraction. Asked about it, Spot bursts out laughing. Well, you got to do that. Look, not every session went the way I wanted it, he says. That was my chance to have the last word on every project that I did. Any word beyond that just becomes hearsay or fan feelings or reviews or promotion or whatever. Once you finish with one project, you put it away. You just can't get so caught up on it that you can't get away from it, which is also, man, that's a real thing about being an artist. Once you finish, uh, sorry, you just can't get so caught up on it that you can't get away from it. Mm. And that was Sam, Sam Backer did a great job with that article. Uh, despite not mentioning the misfits, but that's a personal, right? That's just our personal uh, grievance there. Now this last part is pretty rad. Let's see here. Let us see here. Ooh, we got the headphones. Let's make sure that everything is working the way that it needs to. How is the sound tonight, you guys? Yeah, external headphones. Hope the sound sounded okay. So here is what Spot has to say about the Misfits. I did not, I was like, I can't not have something about the Misfits in here. So this is from the Vinyl Guide. And this dude, I, I don't know his name. Who is he? Uh, about the Vinyl Guide. Nate Goyer is his name. 
and he discusses all things music and record related. And here is the episode. Here's the full episode. Go subscribe to them on the thanks, Dan. I'm glad to hear that. Go subscribe to them on their channel or whatever, wherever they do. Okay, I'm good. I'm glad to hear that, everybody. Damn. Oh, did that go through? Yeah, there it is. So right here is the link for this whole podcast episode. I just want to plug them since we're going to be playing a sound. You can listen on Spotify. Um, you can listen on Apple or Android or subscribe with your existing podcast podcast app on iTunes. Although I think it's, it's Apple Music now, right? In any case, that's the link to get to it. And what we're going to listen to is, is Spot himself uh, chatting with Nate who's interviewed a lot of people. He had a great Erie Vaughn interview as well. Um, and he has a Patreon. These are all truncated episodes. So like the Patreon is if you want to hear the full episode, you got to go to the Patreon. So here is Spot. Here's Spot talking about the Misfits. Ready? It, here we go. Got down to nitty gritty and did it. Does it surprise you that some of these records, like Fat EP and, of course, Ride the Wild... Can you can you guys hear that okay? Let me know if you need to bump it. Those are now going for three, four hundred dollars or more. Uh I don't know if it surprises me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's kinda like the the way the the way the collector culture is is things are priced according to their value on the market and well, okay, fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's true. That is so true. And ultimately, what people are willing to pay, what people are willing to pay for a record is what it's worth, right? eBay, that's how eBay prices and discount prices so, work. So be it. So be it. I'm, I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't really examine it or, or, Mm -hmm. I don't examine it that much anymore. No, but I mean, yeah, these records that uh, at one point, I imagine they probably had a very difficult time selling or even giving away seem to be taking on a life of their own. And yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about uh, misfits. Uh, what are your recollections oh, of, uh, <laughs> Oh, this should be. Oh man. He starts right off the bat. He goes, Oh boy. You could see, so you could tell. Maybe that's why it wasn't in the in the previous article. You could already tell Spot does not like talking about the Misfits, or he's not going to like talking about the Misfits. Let's see what he says. Good. What are your recollections of recording Misfits? Um, hmm. they were they were very difficult to work with, mm -hmm. but I, I I I do I I do have one I do have one great story of one session. That uh, I, I don't think I'm going to tell it to you because I'm just going to save that for the the book. I the book I've already written it down for the book. Wow! Damn. Well, I don't know if the book ever came out. Is that the book of photography or whatever? But like, I'm glad it was written down so it's not lost to history. Because when people pass away and they don't talk about these things, they're lost to time. And again, there was only a, there's only five people who were around or very, I don't know. I don't know if there was five, maybe there was more. Oh, well, that's not true. I think, I think Rocky was there too. There was only a couple of people around for the recording of earth AD and spot was one of them. And he's not the misfit. So he is an unbiased, he is an unbiased POV into that process, which is a very contentious process. Supposedly Glenn was asleep during the sessions. Um, and, you know, Jerry and Doyle and Robo played really fast. They recorded everything in six hours, which makes sense. It's not just a Misfits thing. It's a spot thing, as we just learned about, as we read about the style of recording everything in a live sort of setting and doing it as true to the live sound as possible. So when you look at Earth AD, it really is kind of like the best live record, live recording of the Misfits. Let's, let's listen to what Spot has to say. Okay. And... I've got a bunch of stories like that, or you know, I I haven't found a publisher ready to ready to take it on. Um, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So you received a phone call. Who who called you from Misfits? Was it one of the band members? Do they have a manager that called? I I no, there there wasn't a manager as far as I knew. They were just 
they were just a touring band, and um, I think it was we. I think we talked face to face at some point. Just when they at, at one point they wanted that they, they were they had a sh- some shows out in L.A. and they wanted to schedule a, a recording session. We went into one studio, and then then it you know. The the uh, the I'll put it this way: the tape machine blew up, so we couldn't get anything done. Mm-hmm. It was, that's crazy. See, I didn't know that the tape. That's never been. I they nobody ever says that. Jerry has never talked about that in any interview that the tape machine blew up. We do know that they recorded it uh, through the night. That and that's what, probably why Glenn was sleeping. They did it after they had played a show. So the band was warmed up. They were like hot, ready to go, warmed up. We know that they were in a concrete room or something with Doyle in the middle and Jerry and Doyle facing each other, kind of like three sides of a square, right? Doyle, Jerry, Robo right here. And they're probably able to watch it. They're watching closely. They're mic'd well. They don't have to worry about playing on crappy in a cr- crappy live setting. So they're watching each other's hands for the changes. They're not the, the guitar and, 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 and changes and whatnot. They sound so friggin' tight. And that's all because, I mean, or at least uh, credit impartial to spot. Was not, was not my fault. Uh, so I went out to New Jersey and said, well, let's, let's go ahead and do it here. And so there was, two studios out there that we worked in. I don't remember the names of any of them. Fox it got Studio. to be a little difficult to keep control of what was happening. Mm. Uh, sometimes it was certain people in the band thought they could mix it and <laughs> things went downhill and mm. and there was one situation of... Uh, not having enough money, and I said, "No, you gotta put, you gotta get a little, you gotta have a little more money. We need to do four hours rather than two hours. It's going to take, you know, you you if you want it to come out like shit, and I, you know, I, I had to really talk people into doing it the right, doing it the right mm-hmm. way. Well, doing it the right way, but you know, again, like it was recorded in six hours, right? So, like, I don't know. I mean, come on, like." in your spot sort of way. I don't know. That's it. Wow. That is really interesting. So, so when he says the the tape machine blew up that now that kind of helps to paint the picture of why did they record? They tracked all the music. So when you hear those like demo ish rough versions or versions with scratch lyrics or alternative or, or just instrumentals of, of earth AD, that was probably all the stuff that they were able to record after that, uh, that that show that they played through the night. And then eventually they came back east to finish up and do the vocals. And they did that stuff, the vocals, like the final vocals and whatnot, in, uh, on the East Coast. And I think it was called Fox Studios. That's really interesting. So that's why there were two sessions. The tape machine blew up. And of course, that's when we, we learned that Henry Rollins was in fact doing vocals he was doing backup vocals on on the uh uh, on one of the songs i think queen wasp he was doing backup vocals on um we have to check check that recording let's 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 hear what if spot has anything else to say even people even people who ran the studio oh god those misfits recordings were really at the point where they were breaking up so I would imagine being in the studio with them wasn't the most <laughs> comfortable place to be. I imagine there was arguing and friction between members of the band. Yeah. He's he's trying. I'll I'll take it back. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to step on spot there. Who ran he, the he's, studio? Oh, wait. He he's trying. Uh, uh, Nate. All thank you, Nate. Nate's trying so hard to get to get a uh, spot to spill the beans. You know, because spots being very. You know, he's not giving up any of the goods. He's like, yeah, people and blah, 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 and yada, yada, yada. And uh, Jay Barrett says he doesn't think the book ever came out. But 
you know, listen, with, with maybe it will eventually. I'm glad that it's been documented. And again, like, you know, we're talking about like Spot passed away today. Like, let's, I guess, you know, to have a little respect and understanding for, you know, and not worry about where and what things are. Dude, dude, dude's life ended today. Um, but just that in the future, I hope that something comes of of the things that he knew about and that it comes out in some sort. I just, you know, just that it's documented, you know, properly. But yeah, as I was saying, Nate is trying so hard right now to get the goods out and he it's just not, it's, it's not happening, but uh, salute solution. Uh, I salute you, Nate. Let's, let's keep listening. Oh, God. Uh, those misfits recordings were really at the point where they were breaking up. So I would imagine being in the studio with them wasn't the most <laughs> comfortable place to be. I imagine there was arguing and friction between members of the band. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I, I guess. But I, I, I think that was just a, a factor of living in New Jersey. <laughs> you know, people in New York, and New Jersey, they have their own way of looking at life and dealing with life. And it's not that they're necessarily being uh, antagonistic or anything. It's just that they, that's what they've had to do to survive this kind of middle class hell that they all had to deal with. Mm -hmm. Whether it was living in in New York City or in a suburb in New Jersey across the river, there was just a lot of stuff. You had to be, I guess you had to be streetwise and you had to, you had to talk and act streetwise just to get by. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't really speak to that personally on some levels. You know, I grew up in a nice little suburb in Westchester uh, outside of the city, but I do think that there is a, a little bit of what he's saying in terms, maybe, you know, a lot actually, you know, if you think about the seventies, different times, but just that, um, yeah, there the people in on the East coast in New York, we are wired differently than say West coast people. It's uh, there's absolutely, when you go out to like, when I go to like Colorado or when I do encounter like people from LA, they are, it's like, there is, it's just a different mentality, dude. There is like this sort of like way more sort of laid back kind of vibe. Um, and I feel like that that is so different from like the tri-state area, the tri-state area, you know, mentality, that sort of thing. I don't know. Um, but what was going on at this time with the Misfits? Well, you know, Glenn is experimenting or wants to do, he wants to do Sam Hain. And, you know, some of these songs were written for Sam Hain. And we've talked about that. And, you know, he gave some songs that were meant for Sam Hain for Earth AD. And um, he wanted things to be, or he claims in interviews, he wanted things to be slower and more moody and gothic or whatever. And Jerry and Doyle, you know, take credit and wanted, and, you know, we're listening to, you know, Van Halen and fast and, you know, they're playing with all these hardcore bands too. They're playing with, you know, uh, Erie talks about how Glenn was listening to a lot of gang green at the time, you know, uh, the Boston bands and whatnot, all that stuff kind of influences what earth AD is and earth AD loses a lot of the melodic nuance, or at least the melodic nuance is transformed. It's not like the same, melodic vocals that we hear on things like static age or the horror business version of the band, or even the walk among us version of the band. We now, everything's been sped up and there's a lot less time for, you know, the melodies to sort of what's uh, aerates, if you will, even at a, even at like a break breakneck speed of last caress, there's still time to sort of sing sing you know sing out the melody where earth ad is just <laughs> that's not that's not good that's not right actually there's a band that just got so 
carried away with it in the best way. Hour of the Wolf, man. I, we talked about this Power of the Wolf EP. That is them doing Black Flag by way of Earth AD Misfits. They got the, they're doing basically, it's like Black Flag music with the, with the melodic, with the melodic sensibilities of the Misfits, kind of at least Earth AD melodic sensibilities of the Misfits. And it's phenomenal. All right, let's keep playing this. So, you know, that's kind of maybe more, I'm referring to that more than anything else, mm-hmm. really. Uh, the, the album that resulted from the sessions, Earth AD and Wolf's Blood, uh, there seems to be side A was Earth AD, side B was Wolf's Blood. Is that because it was two different studios, two different sessions? I have, I have no idea. I... I don't necessarily have any idea either, but I do want to just weigh in on this. Just say that, you know, I think maybe it was on this show, actually, where we talked about, we all decided that Earth AD is actually a kind of a double EP, more so than it is like a straight album, although you could look at it as an album as well, um, but that it's like a double EP. It's two EPs kind of put together there's earth ad and wolf's blood in the same way that magical mystery tour is actually also a, a double ep that had more songs add, added to it but alex story from cancer blood cancer slug when i interviewed him for that project i was doing he said my favorite thing about earth ad ever he said earth ad is like one song in nine parts and i gotta kind of agree with that it does kind of feel like a concept album and it does it doesn't necessarily feel like a double ep but in a, i guess it kind of is because it has the two titles and it's not you know what is it like it's like it's nine songs right you know so it kind of feels more ep-ish than it does album-ish it always kind of did in that way uh but spot does not know d- does not know it in this interview okay First, for, uh, Earth AD is the only one I know anything about. Wolf's Blood, what is it? Well, the, the album is typically called Earth AD slash Wolf's Blood. Oh. Yeah. And so there's side A. See, I, 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 never, I never got a copy of it. So I, I, don't, I didn't even know what's... He didn't get a copy of it, but and I was trying to search for this, and I could not find it on Google. But apparently Spot had the... He had the stampers for Earth AD at one point. The you know the aluminum like plating that is used to press the record. He had those the, the mother stamper or the father stamper. He had them. He had the ones for Earth AD on it. Mm. Well, if you get an original copy these days, uh, it'll be about as much as a as a cheap car. <laughs> <laughs> I figure. Yeah. yeah. All right. So let's talk about recording Black Flag. So that's it. And you should obviously listen to the whole episode. Like I said, the link is here. I'll put the link in the comments too. Again, big shout out to Nate Goyer. Thank you for interviewing Spot. Nate has just, he's interviewed so many people and the dude is awesome. In fact, that's a dude I should really try and uh, see if I, I just love to talk music with him, see if I can get him on the show at one point. Um, he's a great interviewer. I, I just, I really appreciate him. So shout out to Nate. And that kind of brings us to the end of the show. Let's just let's just look at some of the comments here. I said I was going to do that, and then we're going to wrap things up. And it's only twelve thirty at night. I thought it was like, oh no, this is going to be like till one thirty. This show. Not too many comments here that we didn't. Um, Dan says R.I.P. Spot. He was involved with lots of great records. One of my favorite records he produced. Oh, we already read that one. Seth says, just recently listened to a Roll- Rollins podcast, Henry and Heidi, where he talks about recording My War with Spot. It's on YouTube. Pretty cool. Yes, I've listened to that episode. I love all the episodes of Henry and Heidi. Those were the best. And I wish Henry would pick it up again. And he has not. Or he does it behind a paywall or something. Sean says, other than Earth AD, I believe Spot's masterpiece was the Black Flag My War album. It's a great album. I like My War especially the last three songs, the LP, they will take you to a dark place. Kevin says, I think Spot did the Descendants first single too. Oh, so that I did not know. R. King says, I think I heard Kurt Cobain you used to write letters to SST Records and try and get on the SST Records label. So imagine going back to what we initially said, imagine, imagine uh, Kurt, uh, Nirvana being on SST instead of Sub Pop 
And let's say that they still wrote Nevermind, note for note, they wrote Nevermind, and Nevermind came out on SST instead of Sub Pop. That would have been that would have been like a seamless. That would have been the 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 seamless um, continuation from punk rock to hardcore punk to like alternative rock grunge, all in one sort of like seamless direction, in a way. Seth says SST bands were surely a huge influence on the Melvins Nirvana. Absolutely, absolutely. Seth also says uh, Rick Okasek produced the but yes, Rock for Light. That's right, the, the live album. Uh, and it's okay, it's an okay live album, but yeah, that was produced by the car uh, by by Rick. Um, Matt John says that Riot Sticker song is too pop for me. I was born in 1972 and thus doesn't sound like punk. Ha 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 ha. Ha 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 hardy har har Matt John. Um Johnny Dingle says I saw the show. I saw that show, and Greg had an opening band called Good for You with Valley and that band suck but Blad Flag with uh Ron Reyes effing ruled. Yeah, good for you. That was great. Uh Greg Ginn had a bunch of opening bands where he was in the opening band, it was just an instrumental band. And he would just be him just like soloing while he had a bass player and a drummer in the pocket the whole time, whatever, you know, I don't know who knows, man, who knows. Um, I, this, I did not know it's it. So rock for light apparently is in the Guinness has a Guinness world record for fastest tempo. Who would have thought? Matt John says Nirvana did plateau. Oh, Oh, me and Lake of Fire. So they did three Meat Puppet songs. Zen Arcade is killer. Guess there's no returning. Charter trip away. Hmm. Um, everybody's happy. Okay, so the sound was good tonight. That makes me happy. That really does. Uh, Jay Barrett said that he didn't think the book came out, but he looked for it the other day. What a shame. Yeah, I'm sure it was Glenn. I'm sure it was Glenn who 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 was probably complaining about money. Probably. Yes, Angus, in case you didn't know, yes, we're, the reason why we're doing this show is because Spot passed away. Really sad. Um, yes, and Jerry and Doyle were listening to Iron Maiden. This is the best comment ever made by Barnacle Bill. Green hell is doo-wop thrash. That is hilarious. Uh, Kevin says that he's 20 minutes behind, but he was going to say, did you hear the vinyl guide? He has a lot of great interviews. Um, and yes, we, we most certainly bookmarked it and he's awesome. Uh, Teak, uh, Fippin, Teak Fippin says spot a great soul spent his later days at my coffee shop in Sheboygan. Okay. So Teak is in, is from Sheboygan and he says that he had great stories, love and miss him already. Teak, I'm so sorry for your loss, considering you actually knew Spot. Teak, if you're here right now, I'll give you a few minutes to respond before we wrap this up. Did you ever hear Spot talk about the Misfits or Earth AD? What, what did he say about the Misfits and or, or, and or recording Earth AD? I would love to know uh, any, any shred, anything you can give us that he might have passed along to you. Uh, we ha oh look at this we have somebody on um what's it called uh, Twitch is here we have somebody on Twitch I, I I don't I don't know how to do Twitch I don't know how to do Twitch man I just I streamed Twitch I'm on Twitch guys but I don't know how to do it at all I, I don't understand it Angus says 1983 Guinness Book of World Records that's awesome. Uh, in regards to the rock of light thing. So we're waiting on uh, Teak right now to see if they are going to confirm whether Spot mentioned anything about the Misfits uh, at the coffee shop in Sheboygan. Love saying that name, Sheboygan. I wonder what the origin of the name Sheboygan is, I suppose. I have the internet in front of me. I could look it up right now. Let's see if the Misfits was mentioned anywhere else here. So we received a phone call. This was just a recording at a point. Yeah, that's about it. That's probably about it. Let's see if here. I'm, 
I have the transcript of the podcast. That's how thorough I was, you guys. I, I downloaded the podcast. I put it into my transcription software so that I could see exactly, because I didn't have time to listen to the whole thing, which I will eventually do. I put it through my software just to see. Yes, Tofu, we want the we want the spot tea. That's what we want. We're waiting on Teak to respond before we wrap it up here. We're gonna I'm gonna give him five minutes to respond. And at exactly 90 minutes, we're gonna peel out of here. I'm gonna get into bed. It's been a long day. I was not expecting to do such a long show. Oh, we the, our 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 Twitch person speaks um that looks like Russian. I'm sorry, I do not speak Russian. Oh man, what a night, huh? What a night. Blank check. Lots of fun. Lots of fun. Totally hadn't seen that movie since the 90s. Man. I got this. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Teak has responded. Let's see what Teak says. Spot talked about the now. He was hazy on misfit stories, but I heard some great meat puppet stories. That's that's cool. I'm sure he didn't like talking about the misfits all that much, I would imagine. Um, as we saw his reaction to that. I'm glad we have a little bit of Spot's uh, actual voice speaking in his own words. And we salute you, Spot. Thank you for all of your records. We have, um, uh, this is our version of paying our respects on the internet as best we possibly can. I hope you enjoyed tonight's show. Please consider uh, signing up as a YouTube member or the Patreon where we have exclusive secret shows and uh, all sorts of little little goodies that you can't see publicly on the channel. Look at this weird Twitch person. Do you eat or play? What a weird thing to say. That's a weird thing to ask somebody over the internet. I suppose it's kind of a normal thing to ask someone over the internet, but weird nonetheless. Whatever. Uh, I'm not going to answer you about that, but whatever. Uh, so yeah, so consider joining one of the Patreon or the YouTube membership. Thank you to all the Patreon and YouTube members for supporting the channel. As always, we got we got more stuff coming. Yeah, maybe it's a troll, maybe not. Who knows? Who friggin' knows? Uh, let's let's take it out with the Patreon itself. Gimme, gimme, gimme! I need some more. Gimme, gimme, gimme! Don't ask what's for. Peace, hair grease. We'll see you tomorrow, maybe. Hey guys, what's going on? It's Jeff. So I've decided to make a Patreon. What is Patreon? I don't know how to define a Patreon. Let me look it up. Patreon is a membership platform that makes it very easy for creators to get paid for the things that they're already creating. I want to do it full time. I want this to be my full time job. In my efforts to make that happen, I've set up this platform. Is it going to work? Is it going to be successful? I don't know, but I would rather try and crash and burn than not try at all. The goal is to create enough passive revenue so that I can continue to do this full time uninterrupted. Why? Because I love to do this. I love creating content. I love making videos. I love shooting films. I love doing podcasts. In case you couldn't tell, I love to talk and I never shut the fuck up. <laughs> so right now I've kept the Patreon incredibly simple. There's two tiers and that may change in the future. The Murdergram is a simple way to extend support for all of the hours and hours of free content on the channel for nothing more than a dollar. 38 cents goes to Patreon. What's a buck 38, eh? It's less than a cup of coffee, but it's a great way that you can show support for very little effort. When you divide that dollar 38 by the hours and hours and hours of time spent listening to this endless drivel of content, the dollar cost average works out. Next up is the YouTube casualty for $6.66. And <laughs> the YouTube casualty is loaded to the gills. Enjoy the archive ad-free as well as ad-free early access to special docu-style podcast videos, music reaction commentaries, and the like a month before they drop on YouTube, loaded with ads, I might add. You're also going to get exclusive content and behind the scenes content that is not available on YouTube or anywhere else. So you get to peek behind the veil. And believe me, there's a couple of choice pieces. 
Most of all, more than anything, whether you join the Patreon or not, I just want to thank each and every one of you that comes to the channel, that watches all the shows, that leaves comments, that participates, that subscribes. That's really the most important thing. This is just trying to find a way to earn a living as an artist. And with that, thank you for my TED Talk. Join the Patreon, because we need you! 66 cents.